Welcome to another AGSIW um, roundtable on uh, GCC South Asia relations, which is an increasingly important and um, very complex uh, sort of um, growing part of international relations. And uh, I'd like also to welcome everyone who's joining us online, live stream. Thank you very much. And let me begin by asking you to um, join me in putting your phones or pagers or any other noise making device on vibrate or off or silent. Thank you very much. That's always a useful thing uh, to do. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think looking at this uh, relationship, uh, there's, uh, there are some basic facts that are pretty well known. Uh, we, we can stipulate them. We don't have to go um, into them in great detail. Um, the, Pakistan is a long-standing ally of many of the Gulf Arab countries, in particular Saudi Arabia. Their alliance dates back to 1947 with the, uh, the uh, emergence of the Pakistani state. It's been there for a long time. It's had a very strong uh, cultural, diplomatic, and religious dimension. It's also had a, uh, a, a strong military dimension with uh, tens of thousands of uh, Pakistani troops variously stationed in, in and around Saudi Arabia at different times, especially in the 1980s. <laughs> Uh, speculation about Saudi cooperation with uh, Pakistan's nuclear program that's never been verified, uh, and uh, a, a continued very strong relationship. And increasingly, uh, the rise of India as a regional player, particularly in the Indian Ocean Basin, which the Gulf is basically a part of and has been since pre-modern and pre-Columbian times. So it's, it's really a, a very ancient, in a sense, relationship between the Gulf and India, uh, India writ large. And uh, increasingly, a uh, strong economic and also uh, diplomatic and political relationship between India as well and various Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, et cetera. On the other hand, both India and Pakistan have strong relations with Iran, and particularly uh, Iran serves as a vital gateway into Central Asia for India, which is otherwise blocked by Pakistan. So it has an indispensable role uh, for India. And this is a complication for um, Gulf countries' relationships with uh, both India and Pakistan, although more for India, but still. Uh, so having understood all of that uh, and having stipulated that the most important aspect of this relationship, both with India and with Pakistan, is uh, an economic and trade relationship. I'm going to ask uh, Afshin to begin mm -hmm. by discussing uh, the uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics of trade uh, and uh, the economic relationship of the Gulf and the South Asian powers. And we'll begin with that as a, a hard basis, uh, which will essentially be the framework for the rest of our conversation. Great. Thanks, Hussein. Uh, and, and thank you to the uh, Arab Gulf States Institute of Washington for hosting this session. Uh, you know, let's, let's go back just a, a couple of months ago, and then let's go back about, um, you know, uh, 13 years ago. So, mm -hmm. well, actually, let's go back just, you know, in the last few weeks. Uh, um, Crown Prince um, Mohammed bin Salman, who visited uh, China, India, uh, and Pakistan. Right. Uh, and, and that visit, we saw some very interesting optics from that visit, the Prime Minister of Pakistan greeting uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, at the air base, driving him personally in his car to mm -hmm. the, to the uh, Prime Minister's uh, complex. We saw Prime Minister Narendra Modi breaking protocol and receiving uh, the Crown Prince as well. Um, China, by the way, adopted correct protocol during the visit. There was no breaking of protocol, but it was a very significant visit, and it also heralded a lot of, of talk in Washington about uh, an Asia pivot from the Middle East. Right, uh, but I would argue that we've been witnessing that sort of uh, eastward shift, so to speak, for at least a decade, decade, decade and a half. If you look at things geoeconomically, mm -hmm. geocommercially, right? Right. Three out of four uh, barrels of oil that leave the GCC states and Iran and Iraq head to Asia. About seventy percent of petrochemical exports from the region head to Asia. Um, you know, China had surpassed. Uh, um, the United States as the biggest uh, trader with Arab League states, you know, several years ago, and they're not going to look back. China recently supplanted the United Arab Emirates um, as the largest investor in the mm -hmm. Arab world, uh, right. and, and that's unlikely uh, to look back. Um, so we've been seeing this geoeconomic shift take place uh, for quite some time. 
And then we go back to, you know, 13 years ago, uh, when King Abdullah ascended the throne in 2005, you know, you know mid-2005 after the death of King Fahad bin Abdulaziz, he ascended the throne, and you are the king of Saudi Arabia, right? You can go wherever you choose to go as your first head of state visit. There are many countries around the world that will roll out the red carpet for you, and he chose tellingly China and India as his first two head of state visits. Uh, and, and in many ways, he saw, he, he saw the commercial wins. Political wins are often uh, uh, are late to the game. But the commercial wins were headed towards China, headed towards India. If you, you, Saudi Aramco saw the writing on the wall, saw the demand growth for crude oil um, uh, in China, saw the potential demand growth for crude oil in India. And those were his first two uh, head of state visits. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would argue that this geoeconomic shift has been happening for about a decade and a half. And now we're entering into not eastward shift 1.0, we're now in eastward shift 2.0. Uh, where we're seeing a, an intensification of the relations. So right. whereas in the past we would see, you know, significant uh, trade flows and significant uh, uh, commercial flows and energy flows, now we're starting to see more what I call heads of state flows. We're seeing just a lot of visits uh, back and forth. We, we, Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, uh, when he visited the UAE in 2015 was his first visit, right, right. Jonathan? It was the first visit of an Indian Prime Minister in the UAE in 30 plus years, right? Um, and then he's been back, you know, another time uh, since then. Uh, and, and we've seen uh, um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, um, uh, you know, on, on several uh, Asia visits, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. Uh, and we're seeing a lot more of this. And when that happens, that sends a signal to state-owned enterprises. It sends a signal uh, across, uh, um, you know, those countries that these are significant relationships. Uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, was the chief guest of India's Republic Day in 2017. Uh, so so these, these are important signals. Now let me just hone in a little bit on the UAE-India relationship because I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very significant one and some of the numbers may even surprise you. Um, you know, when you look at a place like India, soon to be the world's most populous country, um, fast, very fast growth rate, rising middle class, rapid urbanization, uh, you know, unprecedented connectivity as well. Um, this is a, you know, when you look at it from those terms, it's a very interesting market. And, and this is why uh, DP World has been investing in India, the Dubai-based ports operator. Um, this is why MR, the Dubai-based real estate developer, has been investing in India for more than a decade or so. Um, and it's why we're seeing, for example, the recent uh, announcement that Adnak, uh, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company will join hands with Saudi Aramco to invest in a $44 billion refinery. Uh, so just, just two, two or three aspects of the relationship, and then I'll hand it over to my colleagues. Um, Please air connectivity. Take, take your time. Yeah, okay. Air connectivity, right? Um, it, is, it, is extra, it is striking to see the air connectivity between India and the United Arab Emirates. Nearly one out of every three international flights that leave India land in the UAE, right. according to India Civil Aviation Authority statistics, right? Nearly one out of every three international flights, nearly one out of every three international flights that land in India emanate from the UAE. There are, there's, more, the, the, there's more international flights um, uh, from the UAE hubs, particularly Dubai, but, but, but Abu Dhabi is not an insignificant hub for UAE, uh, for India air traffic, nor is Sharjah with budget carrier Air Arabia. Uh, they, there's more international traffic from the UAE than the second, third, fourth, and fifth place uh, combined. Uh, so, so it's, you know, the, in many ways, Dubai has emerged as the air hub uh, of India, but also the larger United Arab Emirates as well, you know, Abu Dhabi and Sharjah. It's not surprising that the largest foreign carrier operating in India is Emirates Airline. Um, you're looking at about 5.5 million passengers annually uh, up going between uh, India and Dubai on Emirates Airline. It's unsurprising that the second largest foreign carrier operating in India is Etihad Airways um, as well. Uh, and and so, so this is a very significant, and particularly if you look at the International Air Transport Association uh, uh, forecast for India. We're looking at, you know, going to from about 100 and, you know, 50, 160 million air passengers today towards, you know, 500 million plus air, air passengers by the year 2037, right? right. Um, if current 
you know, uh, proportions hold, that'll mean that there'll be, you know, close to 200 million passengers uh, flowing through the UAE to India, which begins, helps begin to make sense why Dubai International Airport, which is already the busiest air hub in the world, surpassed London Heathrow a few years ago, um, it, it begins to make sense why they're building a new airport, right? You, you, you begin to think, though, why would they be building a new airport where they're the busiest international air hub in the world? But when you see this kind of traffic, potential traffic, coming from India, uh, that begins uh, to make sense. Um, and, and similar story for Pakistan, where uh, the UAE air hubs have become their air, connect air connectors to the world. You, you connect via Dubai or Abu Dhabi on your way to right. East Africa, on your way to other parts of Asia, on your way to Europe, or on your way to North, North America. So there, the air hub connectivity is striking. Uh, when you look at trade, it's also very striking on the UAE-India relationship. Um, uh, India's top, you know, when you look at their top export destinations, number one is unsurprising, it's the United States of America. Number two is surprising, it's the United Arab Emirates. After all, this is a country of only <coughs> roughly 10 million people. How are they absorbing you know, that much uh, in, of India's exports? Part of it is the same hub model. You know, a lot of the, the exports that, that land in the UAE are re-exported uh, elsewhere. And part of it is simply uh, also because of the, you know, there's such uh, this, this historic uh, commercial uh, trade flows between uh, the two countries. And then when you look at uh, India's imports, again, the UAE figures uh, as a country in the top three. Um, and and when, I, when, I, when I looked at it, I immediately thought, okay, that must be a lot of oil. But actually, the UAE is not one of the top suppliers to India of crude oil. That, that distinction goes to Saudi Arabia and, to a lesser extent, Iraq and Iran that, su that supply more than the UAE does. You have a lot of trade in precious metals, uh, precious stones. Um, you know, th there's, a, there's a very robust diamond trade. Uh, the Dubai Multi Commodities Center has now become one of the largest diamond trading hubs in the world. Nine out of ten of the world's uh, rough cut diamonds are polished in Surat, India. And, and there's an interesting example of how the, the, you know, these, these commercial flows, uh, then, then, then air connections are, emerge as a result of these. The Air India Express is now flying a regular flight from Sharjah to Surat. Um, so we're seeing these, these kind of things develop as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's on the, on the trade. And then you get into the remittances, right? You have about 3.3 million Indian nationals living in the United Arab Emirates. Um, uh, you're looking at about $14 billion of remittances per year. Um, uh, the UAE accounts for about, tw you know, a little over a quarter of all of India's remittances. And India is the largest remittance receiving country uh, in the world and the UAE accounts for about a quarter of those. Uh, so it's, a, it's very significant you know, in that respect. And then you, you add another layer of non-resident Indians of those 3.3 million living uh, in the UAE. Many of them uh, are uh, uh, you know, corporate executives, professionals, mid-level you know, uh, uh, clerks in the consultancies. Uh, and, and the non-resident Indians are also the largest, uh, that live in the UAE, are the largest investors in Indian real estate among non-resident Indians elsewhere. So we're seeing those things. And then, and then the final thing we're beginning to see is there are some large uh, Indian merchant families that have set up in the United Arab Emirates for many years ago. Many of you who've traveled there, you know, might know Lulu Hypermarket, for example. Uh, Lulu Hypermarket all over the uh, GCC region. Uh, and now they're now reinvesting in India, setting up Lulu hypermarkets uh, in India. So if you look at the remittance flows, you look at the trade flows, um, and, and you look at the, uh, you know, in, in the air connectivity, uh, and then you layer on that last piece, the heads of state flows, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a very robust relationship between the UAE and India, which is, you know, mirrored by the relationship between Saudi Arabia and India, um, and Saudi Arabia uh, and and Pakistan as well. So I'll, I'll focus just my initial remarks on those. Okay, that's great. So we have this um, solid basis of trade and commerce, um, which has been expanding with India, as you describe, in a very interesting way. And there is, I think without belaboring the point, a similarly robust and, I know, way deeper, a longer lasting, deeper seated one with Pakistan mm -hmm. and many of the Gulf countries, including the UAE and Saudi Arabia and um, others. Um, so uh, I think we've made the point uh, about the centrality of trade and commerce, but what about 
the rest? What about the um, political, diplomatic, and strategic implications uh, of that trade? And what about the other aspects of the relationship? So, uh, Jock, uh, Dr. Uh, John Lang, if you could uh, address those, uh, you know, for to really get us going, um, so broaden the aperture a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Hussain, and uh, thank you, uh, Arab Gulf Studies Institute in Washington, for having me over. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, to truly understand uh, the UAE-India relationship, one needs to look beyond just that bilateral relationship. Mm -hmm. I think one needs to frame it in the context of uh, Gulf-Asia relations itself. And uh, this can be traced back to about uh, um, 20 years. Uh, to me, the starting point really is 9-11, yep. um, when the Gulf countries were viewed with suspicion in the Western world, and I think uh, Asia was a comfort zone for them. They were willing to accept Gulf investments without too many questions. Uh, and um, uh, I think there was also a complementarity in terms of uh, Asian economic boom and they wanting investments uh, for their infrastructure development. Uh, so that complementarity worked well. Uh, there was also a new approach on the part of the Gulf to shun uh, religious ideology and begin to look at everything in terms of uh, economic sense being common sense. So they were not boxed in by ideology in any Correct. sense of the term. And uh, there was also the plus point in terms of Asia not having any sort of uh, political baggage in their ties with uh, Gulf countries. Um, whereas uh, the United States and Europe was trying to negotiate free trade agreements with uh, the Gulf countries and linking political reforms with economic reforms, um, Asia was not interested in that. They were uh, just bothered about developing economic ties. Um, and, and then there was, of course, the uh, U.S. fatigue factor. Uh, both the United States was having a sense of fatigue about the region, and there was a sense of fatigue on the part of uh, uh, the Gulf countries about the United States and its policy failures in many parts of uh, the Middle East. Uh, so all these combined to uh, help the Gulf countries adopt a look east policy, a east-east camaraderie was developing. To be fair, I think uh, the Gulf was uh, more proactive in trying to promote the look east policy. Um, India and many other Asian countries took some time to respond to that and reciprocate uh, commensurately. But we also need to look at the change in the foreign policy in the Gulf countries itself. The UAE foreign policy from being reactive turned proactive, from, being, from seeking mediators was turning a mediator itself, from um, you know, uh, not just economic diversification, it was beginning to look at uh, foreign policy diversification. It didn't have all its eggs in yep. one basket anymore. It was trying to nurture relationships with a host of countries. Then you also had uh, situations where the Gulf countries were no longer just voting on behalf of others, uh, uh, you know, to host institutions and events uh, elsewhere. But they were seeking votes to host uh, events and institutions like uh, Dubai Expo, for example, or uh, IRENA. So if you, and, and uh, they were no longer just, uh, um, you know, uh, recipients, of security recipients. They were actually trying to promote the idea of being security providers in a sense. So to develop all these kind of um, relationships, they, they were looking at host of countries and not being boxed in by just uh, yeah. one country. Uh, it's, in, it's in that context, and he, uh, and Afshin just mentioned uh, several dynamics with the Indian relationship. I mean, India was a, a growing economy. Um, it's grown from about $400 uh, billion in 1991 to about $2.5 trillion at present. If there is a, a subpar growth of about 5%, uh, it could be a $3.5 trillion economy in the next mm -hmm. couple of years. Uh, and if it grows at about 7.5%, which is what it's growing at now, it could well be a $5 trillion economy by uh, in the next decade or so. So I think all these factors were playing on the minds of the GCC countries in, in terms of uh, tying up with uh, Asian countries. Uh, India itself was trying to link uh, its uh, economic and foreign policies uh, to boost economic growth. I think its foreign policy too became proactive. 
Uh, you may be well aware that uh, uh, India's uh, foreign policy is questioned many a times in terms of why it has relations with Iran or Israel, etc. Uh, the same question is posed in the Gulf as well. But uh, not much credit is given for the kind of sophisticated foreign policy that India has uh, in terms of being able to balance different interests, US on one side, Russia on the other, Iran, GCC countries, Palestine, Israel. It's been able to do that. Um, so, and now it's trying to link up a host of it. It has a neighborhood policy, it has Act East policy, it has Connect Central Asia policy, and the latest uh, approach is Think West. Mm. Um, so the West Asia is an important uh, thing. So it, many people laugh at uh, India's growing power in the region and ask the question, how can it do what it wants to do? Yes, I mean, India is a super poor country at one level, but it's also an aspiring superpower. Um, it, 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 it wants to grow in the hierarchy of nations, it wants to shake up the world, it wants to be a disruptor, but uh, not in the negative sense of the term. It wants to try and shape a much more multipolar world than there is or there will be in the years ahead. Uh, it knows its limitations, uh, it, it doesn't uh, want to extend beyond its means, uh, and, and uh, so we'll, we'll, it'll really take a while before India shapes its uh, muscular foreign policy or security policy in the region. But uh, we must recognize the fact that given these kind of changes and the approaches that both sides are having, that uh, it has impacted uh, UAE-India relations in a big way, UAE-India, not just UAE-India, but India-Gulf relations overall. It's matured, it's gone up several notches, uh, and uh, basically uh, from being just people-to-people uh, -people kind of relations, or P2P, or just business-to-business -business relations, B2B, it's now become government-to-government -government relations. I think G to G, which is where the real change has taken place. Because as long as it's P to P and B to B, it has its own way of going about doing things. You don't need too much of push from uh, from outside to try and ramp that up. But I think the minute the government step in, it zooms a strategic dimension, and that's where we are now. Uh, it's moved beyond a buyer-seller relationship, uh, beyond a transaction-based relationship, and it has assumed uh, strategic uh, dimensions. And I think uh, uh, before, I mean, I, I think I'm sure we, I'll get an opportunity to talk about what the security relationship is all about, but just to add to what uh, Afshin uh, just mentioned about the economic dynamics, uh, there is a strategic component to it. So when we look at a strategic partnership between the Gulf countries and India, or UAE in India, we didn't look at it just from the security prism. I think we need to recognize that there are strategic economic engagements that are taking place. And just to give you a couple of examples, one, uh, India never invested in the oil exploration department uh, in the Gulf in the past. So now it's not just about UAE investing in India, but India is investing, uh, it invested about a billion dollars, roughly $850 million mm. last year in uh, uh, exploration of oil fields in Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, number two, uh, for the energy security that UAE in whatever limited fashion is providing, and it's getting ramped up because uh, two strategic reserves were opened up last year to India, uh, to the UAE, and uh, UAE will be able to exclusively use those facilities to store its uh, oil, and with the caveat that if required, it can sell for commercial reasons as and when they have uh, better demand. Sure. Uh, in return for the energy security that uh, UAE is providing India, India is offering food security to the Gulf. So it's some sort of a uh, food security for energy security kind of model, where they're developing a farm to port uh, uh, kind of arrangement. Uh, UAE is being given exclusive uh, uh, cultivation, cultivable land in, in, in India, where they can't do it themselves, but they can invest to ensure that uh, crops specifically meant for the UAE can be grown in India, and the UAE's investments will uh, help in better logistical facilities along the chain uh, in terms of roads, in terms of warehouses, and the ports are already being operated by the UAE in some sense. So the entire network from farm to port would be uh, you know, uh, provided by, by uh, the UAE itself. And then last, uh, another example would be uh, UAE and India considering cooperation in terms of having uh, 
a back-end manufacturing, spare parts manufacturing unit in India for the Rafale that both countries are planning to buy. And that really is strategic. So if you look at it all, it's just not a buyer-seller relationship any anymore. It's not just about oil trade or expatriates anymore. I think it's moving beyond that, and that's where the strategic dimension come in. Right. That's really great in um, not shifting attention away from trade and commerce, but broadening. The, the, the aperture, which is exactly what I asked for, and that's great. And, uh, but so far, we've talked about a lot about um, Gulf Arab-Indian relations, and I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Bukhari to bring in the Pakistani dimension, which I think has been uh, you know, mentioned a couple of times but not focused on. Uh, so uh, I would invite you to talk about you know, that aspect of this relationship and where especially the uh, Pakistani-Indian rivalry and the uh, Gulf Arab-Iranian rivalry play. <laughs> they, they both sort of influence uh, the relationship in both directions, yes? Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Thank uh, you, sir. I, uh, I appreciate uh, AGSIW for organizing this panel uh, and, and for inviting me. So to jump right in um, I, I, and, and to pick up from where uh, uh, Dr. Janardhan left, I think that um, because of India's rise, India's rise has sort of complicated things from, for Pakistan. You have to understand that Pakistan, uh, how does it see itself? And, and, and I think it sees itself as a weak country with multiple problems. Uh, it's sort of strategic worldview. Uh, Afshin talks about and eloquently about geoeconomics. The Pakistani viewfinder uh, is still stuck in classic geopolitics, the geopolitics of security. Uh, it's not a confident state. Uh, it has many internal problems. And uh, its, its foreign policy is very India-centric. Everything is about India. If you look at Pakistan's relationship with China, look at Pak how Pakistan views Afghanistan. If you look at U.S.-Pakistani relationship and now GCC-Pakistan relationship, uh, they're all viewed from India and increasingly so. Why is that? Uh, from the Indian point of view, um, some would say, and, and I, I share this view, it may be cynical, is that from the Indian point of view, Pakistan seems like a, a distraction, to put it really mildly, from India's objectives of becoming that global player that Dr. Janardhan talked about. It, it's almost as if from New Delhi's point of view, Pakistan is holding it back, uh, and, and it, it sort of forces India back into sort of playing right. regional little league, whereas India sees itself as the cusp of playing major league. In fact, it already is. Reverse that. Pakistan sees in, uh, Pakistan has always seen India as a threat regionally. And now India becoming a, a, a global player uh, basically amplifies that threat perception. And what makes matters worse is the past 15 years uh, or so of GCC-India relations. And, and traditionally, as Hussein talked about in the beginning in the is of his presentation, that Pakistan has been lo along an ally for Saudi Arabia and the other GCC mm -hmm. states. That has shifted, and the Pakistanis yep. see themselves as, uh, you know, out of this game, if you will, or at least right now. Or as the losers. If as you, the yeah. losers, right. if you will, to it's, put it a bit at more their strongly. Expense, right? yeah. And so... Uh, and, and that is the that is sort of the guiding principle of of how the strategic, uh, you know, the, it is the view from Islamabad, if you will, the official view from Islamabad, whether it's the military looking at it, whether it's the intelligence services looking at it, or the foreign ministry, or the civilian government. Uh, that that's sort of the worldview. One of the uh, and and then of course there are sort of arresters to Pakistan, mm -hmm. regional and domestic. So domestic, two of them. One is the chronic problem of, uh, you know, the, the, the economic and financial problems that Pakistan has suffered uh, and, and the reliance on, uh, you know, foreign assistance, whether it has been uh, cash from GCC, uh, cash from the United States, mm -hmm. which after 9-11 has, you know, gone down tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, and now cash-strapped reliance with China in the form of the China-Pakistan economic corridor that is much celebrated, and rightfully so, but then there's also sort of a cost to it that Pakistan is perhaps not realizing just yet, at least not 
it's not being debated as much as it should be, uh, the, the, the positives, and, and again, rightfully so, are being celebrated. Uh, Pakistan has a chronic infrastructure problem, uh, whether it's with you know, power generation, natural gas supply, uh, just infrastructure in general across the, the, the length of the country, which the Chinese are now addressing, uh, but at a cost of $62 billion and is not really clear how will that sort of affect Pakistan's existing uh, national debt, the, the external debt it, that it owes. Uh, Pakistan is in the business, uh, is in the process of negotiating yet another IMF loan. Uh, the figure thrown out by the new government of Prime Minister Imran Khan, particularly his finance minister, uh, Assad Omar, uh, it was like 12 billion when they took right. office. That has sort of been brought down because mm -hmm. about 6 billion has been procured or at least promised to Pakistan from the GCC countries, Saudi Arabia and the UAE particularly. Mm. Um, now, of course, that's a chronic problem. Then that problem, the, the lack of a, uh, you know, a, a, an economy that's a drag is the, uh, is the domestic sort of incoherence of Pakistan, whether we talk of civil military relations, whether we talk about the, 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 the divide internally amongst sort of the provinces, uh, or we talk about, you know, the Islamist experience of Pakistan. Now, uh, since 2007, uh, I've been arguing that Pakistan is sort of in the very early stages of a post-jihadist era. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I think that Pakistan is out of the eye of the storm of, of jihadism and, 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 and everything that we've seen. 80,000 people lost their lives from 2007 until about 2000, until the present, roughly speaking. I think that the Pakistani state has put down the, uh, the, the, the terrorists that were fighting the state, mm. the groups that were fighting the state, but there is latent uh, and, and uh, extremism that stretches across the, the breadth and length of the country that the Pakistanis have not been able to address. And what that does is that, you know, poses a problem for investment in the country. So investors look at that and say, maybe, you know, this isn't the right time. And they, it's, Pakistan is not seen as sort of this lucrative market to go in by investors. Uh, certainly the GCC is not looking at it uh, that way. And GCC are some of the most closest allies of Pakistan. So there is, uh, you know, a, a bit of resentment. And, and again, you know, that, that feeling that we have lost out in this struggle uh, with India. So though, uh, the, the chronic financial problems and, and, and the uh, incoherence of, you know, the social, political, economic, uh, the social, political issues that have bogged down the country uh, have really uh, constrained Pakistan. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, the, the war in Afghanistan next door. From the Pakistani point of view, uh, it's been going on for 40 years, and it, it dates back to the Cold War era when the Soviet troops came in, and, and Pakistan, along with Saudi Arabia and the United States, were fighting the Soviets. Once the Soviets left, the United States packed up and left, and Pakistan has been dealing with that situation ever since, but has also sort of tried to make use of its investment in Afghanistan to deal with India. So in, 19, in the 1990s, when an in, in indigenous insurgency or uprising began in the Indian-administered Kashmir, the Pakistanis said, hmm, this is very interesting, we've just had you know, successfully pushed out the Soviets from Afghanistan. Lessons learned can be applied. Those resources, those militants, those proxies can be, uh, you know, uh, redirected towards Kashmir. Pakistan spent an entire decade doing that until the Kargil War in 1999. Uh, and, 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 and that was a time period when uh, there was immense civil military tensions as well. Again, a decade lost in terms of economic development. Um, <laughs> We have the Musharraf era in 1999. Musharraf comes to power uh, after, his, uh, after the coup, and then 9-11 happens. And then again, Pakistan is in uh, you know, a, what the Pakistanis and others would call a transactional relationship with the United States, uh, where you know, billions of dollars are given to Pakistan in, uh, to support the global war on terror, and, and, and then there's fallout from that. All the while, uh, the threat perception of India is still there. Pakistan has not dealt with, uh, you know, how it will, uh, or at least has not 
moved away from its sort of classic thinking on how to deal with India. It's still stuck in the, mm -hmm. in, in the security paradigm that this poses a threat. Reinforcing that is, you know, uh, uh, the, the rise of the BJP in India, the right-wing Hindu nationalist government, uh, the, uh, the Indian response to Pakistani support for Kashmiri militants in the form of Indians, uh, you know, investing in, uh, you know, supporting the Baloch rebels based in Afghanistan. So it's almost as if reinforcing that narrative that the Pakistanis have about India. So I think that while the rest of the region to the west of Pakistan and to the east of Pakistan is moving into an era of geoeconomics, Pakistan is still stuck with the old way of looking at things uh, from a pure existential security paradigm. That, yeah. you know, and that is why uh, the military remains very dominant in the country. Uh, I mean, there are other factors, the weakness of the civilian sectors of society and whatnot, but nonetheless, this sort of strategic reality is what is shaping Pakistan. I'm going to leave it right there. Thank you. No, it's great. And so then the, the question that all of that kind of raises is to what extent does uh, the growing relationship between these two regions affect uh, the relations between India and Pakistan, if at all. I mean, obviously there's this trade relationship we've been talking about, but a lot of people have wondered if uh, the, the Gulf countries um, were uh, overtly or implicitly some kind of mediating force mm -hmm. uh, in the recent flare-up between mm -hmm. India and Pakistan, or, we, uh, yeah, or if not, uh, could they eventually be that? In other words, could this relationship help to um, ease tensions mm -hmm. between the two nuclear rivals and right. anyone who wants to uh, sure you yeah, know to please. to Janardan's point that that um, you know for the the GCC states were you know often would receive mediation and now they're acting as mediators I think there was a lot of uh, um, talk about how th they were alarmed by the recent flare-up in, uh, in in between Pakistan and India and then they did um, actively engage in you know whatever mediation uh, that they could and I'll let Janardan don't speak to that mm. but just you know in a simply as a convener you know um, again if you look at um, the UAE look Dubai has long been the Hong Kong of South Asia right, right. Um, right. Uh, and it's it's the place that's easy to meet you know you connect in, in and and Abu Dhabi has be, be getting involved in much more in convening we saw the Taliban talks uh, in Abu Dhabi um, and so I, I, I could easily envision um, now let me put it this way India and Pakistan are not Ethiopia and Eritrea. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, the UAE played a, a very significant role in the recent Ethiopia Eritrea reconciliation, right. um, uh, and and you know and and that was yet another one of those intractable conflicts that was never going to get resolved, and you know the two sides were too uh, hardened against each other, and and so so there is there is precedent for the UAE playing that kind of role, and I'd love to hear what Janardan has to think about. Yeah, that. That, that, yeah. I would like I would too. Yeah. yeah. I think you gave a very good example in Eritrea and Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and, and that India and Pakistan are not uh, Ethiopia yeah. and Eritrea. Right. No, they're yeah. not. So, <laughs> so right. uh, the point is, um, to answer the question posed by Hussein, yes. one needs to go back to uh, what happened in 2001. I mean, I think uh, that fundamentally, 2001 fundamentally altered Gulf's relations with India or vice versa. Uh, essentially because until then, the Gulf countries led by Saudi Arabia held uh, the Pakistani view that Kashmir was a disputed territory mm -hmm. and that there should be third-party mediation. Right. Uh, it was for the first time in 2001 that Saudi Arabia went along with the Indian view that it is a bilateral problem and that there is no room for third-party mediation. That fundamentally altered um, the Gulf-India relations because once Saudi Arabia took that view, the rest of the GCC countries fell in line. And right. if you, uh, all of us remember that the GCC at that point was a fairly united body. So yes. they, they went about uh, uh, you know, sticking to that line. Mm. And thereafter, there was an upswing in, in, in Gulf-India relations. And uh, just because India was a much more lucrative economy, their ties uh, 
began to match up with uh, political engagement as well. And uh, now it's come down to the security aspects. But uh, uh, to answer your question specifically, sure. I am not too sure that um, the Gulf countries can do too much in terms yeah. of uh, mediating between mm -hmm. India and Pakistan. First, because India doesn't like anybody mediating on behalf of it on the Kashmir issue. Right. Um, two, they will be ineffective if they did mm -hmm. do something. At best, India would want Saudi Arabia and UAE to use the leverage they have on Pakistan to yeah. crack down on terrorism and sure. cross-border terrorism. Um, and uh, or the Saudis could have had uh, a, a pretty uh, influential role in trying to uh, ensure that the captured pilot, Indian pilot in Pakistan was released. Um, Pakistan can be worked on by Saudi Arabia and UAE, but I don't think uh, India would uh, uh, you know, entertain any of that, and the but GCC countries know that very well. There isn't any evidence that they did, right? I mean, it looks like an entirely Pakistani de-escalation move, right? It, mean, it, it could well be, because uh, I think um, uh, Pakistan realized that uh, if the pilot isn't returned yeah. in good time, then yeah. there would be further escalation on right. the part of India. Which, which so was it not could, a good idea. yeah, exactly. So right. I, I really don't think there was uh, too much of uh, Gulf mediation, but they did use their, uh, you know, good, good offices office. because at the end of the day, uh, the logic is that they need a stable South Asia, oh, sure. which has always been their uh, interest. They also want to ensure that their economic investment in the region doesn't go to waste if okay. these two countries so, go to war. So they would impress upon them to, uh, you know, de-escalate, uh, but that's really not mediation so the, the, at the, the end of the day. the gist of your answer is it doesn't hurt. It doesn't but hurt. But it's, it's no panacea. It's not a big... So, uh, Kamra, I, I'm, I want to bring in the audience in a second. Um, uh, but we haven't heard much about the, the uh, role that... Um, both India and Pakistan's warm relations with Iran play in, in their interactions with um, Gulf countries, particularly with the Gulf countries that really are estranged from Iran in a very dramatic way, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, and um, even some of the others, but especially those three. Um, Definitely. But if you allow me, I'd like I to address your first course, question. Absolutely. Uh, I would take it to the next level. I, uh, I would say not only is... I think that the Gulf countries, because of their relationship, their unique and very different relationship with India and Pakistan, mm. can actually uh, play a third party role mm. uh, in the sense, not in the sense of mediating the Kashmir conflict. Right. I don't think the Gulf states are interested in getting into that thorny subject. I think anyone I, is. But I think that in order to, to push, to nudge Pakistan towards, uh, you know, looking at the region a bit differently, at the same time, you know, when when you're when you're a third party mediator or inter interlocutor, you sort of you know try to bring do shuttle diplomacy. You try to bring the two sides together, of course, in keeping with your own interest. What is the GCC interest? Well, let's not go to blows because mm. there are billions of dollars at stake here, and we don't want this to be messed up. I mean, a good perhaps analogy is just as the uh, the GCC states do not want a U.S.-Iranian shooting war mm -hmm. in the Persian Gulf. I think to a lesser extent, they would not want that happening in South Asia. So I think that there is a, some significant room for, uh, for the Saudis and the UAE to do kind of like, okay, let's talk to the Pakistanis, and then the Pakistanis will obviously say, well, we have these reservations. They'll go to the Indians and try to see what happens. I think, will they pr play that role? I don't know. Can they play that role? I really do think so. Now, coming back to Iran. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. I, I think that on Iran, uh, it, it, let's look at it from the Iranian point of view. The Iranians don't really have a choice. Uh, so, yes, from the Iranian point of view, the GCC-India relationship is very robust. So they're already yep. operating in, on an uphill level. So their task to forge relationship with India is, is very uh, uphillish. Now, yes, there is the Shabahar port. Yes, there is uh, that India sees Iran uh, as a gateway and bypassing Pakistan to go into Afghanistan and beyond into Central Asia. That infrastructure isn't developed yet. So it is an aspirational thing. Uh, Shabahar itself is still in the making. You know, there's been some 
goods being brought in, ferried from India to uh, destined for Afghanistan, going through Shah Bahar, it's very, you know, it's, I wouldn't even call it 1.0 yet. Mm -hmm. I think that the road infrastructure is not there inside Iran, although the Indian, Corps of, uh, Indian Army Corps of Engineers, to their credit, many years ago, about 10 years ago, built the, the, that Delaram's Zaranj Highway that sort of connected the Garland Highway that connects five cities in Afghanistan to Iran. But I don't think the Iranians have that infrastructure going all the way to Shah Bahar just yet. It's very rudimentary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then much less to go from the Persian Gulf throughout the entire length of mountainous Iran into Turkmenistan mm -hmm. and then beyond. That's not there either. It's an aspirational thing. So from the Iranian point of view, the Iranians are looking at it and saying, okay, I have a Pakistan that is definitely in the Saudi camp. Mm -hmm. Can't trust them. Right. Terrorism happens from their territory against our, uh, you know, uh, security forces. I look at India. Well, India has a more stronger relationship with the GCC. So how much am I going to get? At the end of the day, I think the Iranians will take what they, what they can get. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, their relationship w with India. From the Pakistani point of view, since there is a border with, with Iran and it's caught in sort of the geosectarian trap because of the Shia Sunni thing between Saudi and Iran, that conflict, and we saw that play out where the Saudis were very upset visibly with Pakistan and the UAE expressed, uh, you know, anger as well for the Pakistanis not giving troops to the Yemen war. Right. And so uh, Pakistan is caught between a, a rock and a hard place, even though it, by default, it leans heavily towards Saudi Arabia. It wants to be able to cultivate a relationship. And one of the reasons why Pakistan is probably not taking chances mm -hmm. is because of the U.S. sanctions on Iran, which has also constrained India from doing much with Iran as well. And, and India could, is in a far better position than Pakistan to do business with Iran just because it's a bigger economy. Uh, Pakistan could have used Iran as sort of an, a, a source of natural gas that is much needed. Well, JCPO happened. The Pakistanis were you know, happy that maybe this is the opportunity to build that, uh, you know, operationalize that dream of importing natural gas from Iran didn't happen because the JCPOA is dead in the water or doesn't exist, depends on how you look at it. Uh, so I, I think that at the end of the day, Iran can only go so far, but I, I think there are more implications for Pakistan from the Iran-Saudi conflict and the US-Iran conflict, and, and, but India can better manage it just because of the size of its economy and more financial bandwidth. A couple of thoughts. Just yes. add no, I would that. like both of yeah. you, if okay. you want to okay. add something on, okay. the, on uh, the okay. Iranian dimension, sure. and then we'll bring in sure. the audience. Yeah. Um, you know, I I Indian um, officials like to you know, refer to the civilizational links between India and Iran, and right. certainly there's truth to that, of course. Um, you know, as a as a Persian speaker myself, uh, when I am uh, among uh, South Asians or when I'm in, uh, in India, I'm often struck by how many members of the Indian elite or the Pakistani elite will begin reciting Persian poetry right. uh, to me. Um, so there, there is these civilizational links. Uh, um, having said that, when, you know, during the sanctions era, in the Obama sanctions era, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the U.S. was demanding that countries reduce their intake of Iranian crude oil, Oil, um, Indian government officials would beat their chests and say this is extraterritorial and this is, you know, we're not going to abide by this. And Indian refiners would quietly reduce their intake of Iranian crude oil. Um, you know, and, and when push came to shove, they, they sided with, you know, the United States um, uh, you know, for understandable reasons, of course. Um, but one of the other things that was happening during that era is that uh, companies, refiners in India, China, Japan, and South Korea we're telling the Iranians, telling the National Iranian Oil Company that I'm sorry, we can't pay you in dollars because of these sanctions. And it was, it was, a, it was a convenient thing to say that because then Iran would have to set up escrow accounts in Indian banks and in Chinese banks and, and in uh, Japanese mm -hmm. banks. And, 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 you know, if you set up, you know, you had billions in escrow in renminbi, Chinese renminbi, and, you know, you could at least buy some overpriced industrial machinery with that, right? Um, but one Iranian uh, Chamber of Commerce official joked uh, with me at, a, at, a, at an event that, you know, we have all this money with, with India, um, 
you know, how much, you know, all these rupees, how much basmati rice can we buy? I mean, we, we do eat a lot of rice, but, but there, so there was this sense, even among the National Iranian Oil Company executives, that there were countries that were taking advantage of Iran during this time period, including China, including India, um, in, including Japan and South Korea. Now, there's not much they could do about it, and they still remain important buyers of Iranian crude oil today. Um, uh, but when you know push came to shove, they, they had to side uh, with uh, the United States. Well, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think uh, whenever India sided with the United States, I'll start from there. Yeah. Whenever mm -hmm. India sided with the United States, um, against Iran, it was again a strategic move because I think when they voted against Iran at the IAEA, it was essentially a period when India was negotiating the 123 agreement mm -hmm. with the United States. They didn't want that to be uh, scuttled in any way. Uh, it did what it did. Um, and and uh, it, it's uh, doing its fair bit, but in terms of adhering to, mm -hmm. it's got a waiver now in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in terms of the sanctions imposed just now. Mm -hmm. But Iran is, not just important uh, for its oil. It is important for its oil. It was getting roughly about 15% of its oil at one point in time. It's down to between 6 and 8% now, uh, officially. Uh, I'm sure there must be something behind the scenes that's happening in terms of how the oil, Iranian oil is coming into India. Uh, because uh, a lot of uh, refineries in India are geared towards uh, Iranian crude. So it's not easy to just change that overnight. Uh, that's point number one. But uh, more importantly, uh, Iran is of strategic value to India for the reasons that uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Kamran mentioned, yes. in terms of uh, being able to approach Afghanistan, Central Asia, etc., because uh, Pakistan doesn't allow India to use uh, its land route, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's strategic value uh, to the third factor, which is often overlooked, is uh, that India has one of the world's highest uh, Shia population, just by the size of its Muslim population, with right. about uh, nearly 200 million Muslims in India. And uh, if you were to take uh, that uh, 20, 25 percent of that is Shia, uh, you would roughly have 40 to 50 million uh, uh, Shiite Muslims in India. And that's uh, a big number of Shiite Muslims. It's and second biggest in the world, right? Yeah, second biggest. Uh, any, any, I mean, definitely top three, top five, if yeah. not the top third. Th third, yeah. After okay. Azerbaijan. After, uh, Iran right. and Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. Okay, That's so right. there you go. So third. So, so uh, and uh, India has never had a problem in terms of how Iran deals with Shiites in India like the rest of the Gulf countries or the Middle East uh, has had problems. Mm. So in that sense, India doesn't really see Iran as a liability in any sense of the term. Mm. It's, uh, it's an asset and its capability of trying to balance relations uh, is something that's come in handy. So it hasn't upset the US too much. It hasn't upset the GCC countries too much. And that relationship will continue to thrive. And I don't think uh, in the years ahead, uh, neither the GCC countries will be told to take sides, India versus Pakistan. Right. Or India would be told by the GCC countries to take sides, uh, Iran versus GCC. As a corollary of all of that, India perceives the uh, problem of uh, extremist Muslim terrorism as a, essentially a Sunni problem, right? Sure. And it, it does. It is. It is very. Um, it doesn't uh, worry much about Absolutely. the uh, Iranian-inspired Shia extremism that many others are, you know, if you mention, uh, you know, m Muslim extremists, they might think of both or think of Iranian groups uh, and Iranian-sponsored groups. Of course, India wouldn't, so that's another And I think uh, important th point. Th if there is one particular Muslim community which votes for the right-wing groups, uh, for the BJP, for Modi, it's the Shia community yeah. because they exactly. think that uh, it's the right-wing governments which uh, promote business them, yeah. and they're more interested in uh, business uh, development rather yeah. than the religious angle. Yeah, exactly. Even those in Kashmir. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, that's a great basis for bringing you all into the conversation. There's an infinite number of paths that can be followed. We've got a couple of mics. Um, please identify yourself. And if you want to ask a question to the whole panel and anyone, if you want to ask to a specific person, go right ahead. So who's first? Please. It, it, Mike is coming. It's, it's right here. Yeah, thanks. That, that's for the uh, audience yeah, online. Yeah. No, I understand. I appreciate uh, thank it. you. I'll ask my question, and then after I get an answer, I'll have to run. Because okay, I, no problem. <laughs> so I apologize. No, 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 no. Uh, my question, you have talked, uh, all of you, 
talked a lot about the G relations with the GCC. Yes. And then you talked a lot about the relationship with Saudi Arabia and UAE in mm -hmm. particular. Yes. Now, we all know that the GCC is mm -hmm. barely there any yes. longer. And my question is, what do, uh, does India and, uh, do India and Pakistan manage to bridge the divide within the GCC? In other words, is there yes. a relationship with Qatar? Mm -hmm. as well as with, uh, uh, with the, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE? Wonderful question. Who would like to go first? You, you know, I'll just say briefly that I have yet to see that um, the, particularly Abu Dhabi or Riyadh demanding that Delhi or Islamabad choose. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I have yet to see that. It, it, whereas they, they have, um, you know, uh, asked many of their Arab allies to yes. choose, yes. you know, but they have yet not yet done that in Delhi and Islamabad. And also, as I understand it, the, the uh, India is one of the biggest purchasers of LNG from Qatar, and one of the largest purchasers of petroleum from the petroleum exporting GCC states. Mm -hmm. at, but uh, in the Qatar boycott, the one thing that's so far been off the table is LNG exports. Mm -hmm. There's been no effort to block them. There's been no effort to disrupt shipping. There's been no effort to uh, interfere in Qatar's ability to export LNG. So that might help to place all of this a bit off the table. But yeah. anyway, yeah. just speculation on my part. I, I think um, your question takes me back to what I said in terms of how the Gulf countries would not be encouraged to play a mediatory role, at least mm. from the Indian perspective. The same applies uh, in this case, because India wouldn't want anybody to interfere in its affairs, nor w would it interfere in anybody else's affairs. Because it would simply claim that this is a situation between Qatar and the other GCC countries, and, and it's left to them to decide how to sort it out. Because I think one of the fundamental uh, principles uh, of the Indian foreign policy, not just in the region, but across the world, and it was very uh, well put out by uh, the Indian Minister of State uh, just in 2018, mm. and he said, uh, it's non-descriptive, non-intrusive, non-judgmental, and it will not take sides in any inter-regional disputes. Yeah. So that's a clear policy. So it would just let others deal with their own problems yeah, as it would like to be left to deal with its, its own. It's a strong legacy of the non-aligned tradition. I mean, it's very deeply rooted. So uh, I would just add that um, I don't think Pakistan is in a position to uh, do it and I, I don't think that it's interested. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the uh, just as Pakistan is sort of like really tiptoeing the Iran versus Saudi thing, even though it's in the Saudi camp, mm -hmm. uh, I think that Qatar becomes even more problematic. Here, mm -hmm. Here's a country, Pakistan, that's reliant on direct financial assistance from UAE and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. It does not make any sense for them to even bring this up. Yeah. Ma as long as the uh, GCC, and I don't think that the GCC countries are interested in taking the Qatar feud to South Asia, mm -hmm. it works perfectly. The Pakistanis can deal with, you know, Imran Khan just went to Qatar, yeah. and he just co uh, courted Mohammed bin Salman, and mm -hmm. he has a relationship with the Emiratis. So I think these are separate, parallel yeah. Yeah, silos. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, <coughs> okay, who's next? Jean Fasson. Oh, okay, so we'll, we'll do, each one can have a microphone, and we'll begin with you since you have it, and then we'll go to you. Okay. Sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mel Ude. Uh, Hi. Uh, earlier in our conversation, we, <clears throat> and I'm paraphrasing here, we sort of defined or characterized the dynamic of the relationship between the GCC countries and India as being sort of a more multi multi-dimensional geoeconomic yes. sort of mm -hmm. construct. But in contrast, we looked at India, uh, the GCC and Pakistani relationship and sort of defined it in a more narrow, limited geo, yeah. strategic, geopolitical uh, frame uh, of reference. In light of the recent very resounding no that Pakistan gave to the Saudis and uh, the UAE as it relates to the oh, deploying yeah. of um, troops in Yemen, yes. I mean, it was a unanimous vote from the Pakistani parliament. Right. Uh, to what extent is that relationship changing, right? To what extent, yeah. and specifically as it relates to the internal political dynamics within Pakistan, given the U.S. experience with Pakistan as a partner during the um, war on terrorism in Afghanistan, mm. it's not one, it's not a state that some in Washington would describe as a unitary political actor. 
There are many different power verticals. There's an inherent tension between civilian and military, with the military oftentimes having an overweening influence in Pakistani foreign policy. That's a great question. To the extent that, um, can we, to what extent can we interpret right. this pivot in terms of not putting uh, geostrategic or geopolitical um, factors at the head of deciding Pakistani yeah. uh, GCC policy. Okay. To what so extent can we interpret that two, as a change? Uh, it's kind of a two-pronged question you've asked, though. Right. I mean, one one has to do with the nature of the relationship, changing relationship, and this or the caveat or the the second the sub question within it is. Uh, the uh, internal Pakistani dynamics that are driving that. So this is an excellent question. Uh, would you like to begin? Sure. Okay, great. Um, I think that there is nuance here. There is complexity. I think that um, uh, I think that what the Saudis were looking for when they asked. Well, actually, let me step back. I think that Pakistan will help Saudi. Has helped Saudi with the security situation. Mm -hmm. But I think that it needed, so the Saudis needed a symbolic show of support, and that could have come when Pakistan would have said, yes, we're putting X number of troops to the Yemen cause. The Pakistani thing was that, look, we're going to help you, but we, not right now. Mm. Can't do this because, A, there is not just parliament. Parli mm. The parliamentary vote was a reflection of something that doesn't get discussed, which is there is deep resentment within Pakistan towards sort of Saudi Arabia for a couple of reasons. One, uh, and it doesn't get aired because Pakistan, the Pakistani state doesn't want it to get aired for obvious reason, and B is because it's sort of you know, sub-national. There is w one aspect is uh, that all this extremism is from the Wahhabi ideology that came from Saudi Arabia. We, there wasn't, there, we, we're not Wahhabi and therefore this came from the Gulf. Right. And so if United States, you are angry at us because of extremism, well, you should redirect your anger yeah. to Saudi Arabia. They right. sent it here. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's number one. And this is a resentment within the public mm -hmm. that, hey, you know, we used to be very liberal people and all of a sudden, <laughs> un, you know, 30 years later, we're like mini Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That's one. Number two is, and this was aired recently by the prime minister of Pakistan, is that there is this, uh, a large number of Pakistanis who have gone to work in Saudi Arabia uh, have come back with tales of being discriminated against. As So... When the Pakistani leadership says, Saudi Arabia, fellow Muslim country, brotherly Muslim country, these people look back cynically and says, what are you talking about? They treat me like I'm their servant, like a second right. class citizen, and, and uh, you know, I have personal evidence. So mm -hmm. the Pakistani prime minister tried to address that national sentiment by when sitting next to Mohammed bin Salman right. during his visit saying, hey, could you take care of our workers over there because right. they're really near and dear to my heart and I care for them so I would like you to care for them. And that's hardcore domestic politics. And that's, yeah. that has nothing to do with right. Riyadh Islamabad. That has to do with domestic politics. So there is that aspect of it. In the end, Pakistan w it will help Saudi Arabia has in the past, will continue to, it is not going to join Iran uh, and, but what it, Yemen was different. Yemen was seen as very horrific uh, and, and it's, it's negative press for Saudi Arabia. Right. And keep in mind, Egypt also did not jump in. In fact, when this was going on, the chief of staff of the Egyptian armed forces traveled to Pakistan right about the time and it was speculated that, well, are these guys comparing notes But because both countries have been asked to contribute troops. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that was a specific occasion that happened by and large the, if you know the Pakistanis have publicly said that if Saudi Arabia is if there is a threat to Saudi Arabia we will defend it there was, it was un, it was unambiguous right mm -hmm. would either of you care to uh, sure just add in uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that you know many of the things that i said about the uae india geoeconomic geo commercial relationship you know do obtain uh, to a lesser extent when at least it comes to the uae pakistan you you do have similar 
instances of state-owned enterprises like DP World, uh, you know, operating ports in Karachi, uh, mm -hmm. the MR, the real estate developer, developing, you know, these real estate projects uh, in in uh, Pakistan. Um, you do have, you know, big uh, important companies like Mubadala uh, investing in refineries in, in Pakistan. Uh, and then you have the this, the the uh, state-to-state -state transfers, you know, uh, the UAE depositing $3 billion in the Pakistan Central Bank or Saudi Arabia. Arabia depositing, you know, in the Pakistan Central Bank as well. So, mm -hmm. and then you've got, again, about 200 flights a week between Pakistan and the UAE. Emirates and Etihad are all over. So, so the UAE has also become Pakistan's air hub to right. the world, um, in much the same way that it has become India's air hub to the world. We've got about 1.5 million Pakistanis living in the UAE. Um, uh, uh, the number one or number two remittance sources for Pakistan are Saudi Arabia and the UAE. They tend to go, you know, depending on which year the other one is number one or the other one is number two. So there is that there is that kind of geo commercial relationship um, as well to a lesser extent. Um, but but as was noted here, it's the you know the imagine the optics. Imagine you are you know Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and 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 you know you, you, you the what. Imagine the thought of going to the West is probably not very appealing to you these days, right? Um, uh, and then you go to Pakistan, and and uh, the prime minister breaks all protocol and greets you at the air force base and puts you in his personal car and takes you. Uh, you go to India, drives uh, you, drives you, drives you personally. You know, to the you go you go to India and Narendra Modi is breaking all protocol and the kind of language that is being used of you know brotherly relations. Uh, uh, and it is uh, uh, that th those images are, are, are not insignificant, mm -hmm. you know. And if you are Saudi Arabia, you know, you've taken note of those receptions. Uh, and I, I, I would, I would and, and when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia wants to, you know, invest in, uh, he's going to remember those kind of receptions. Excellent. Yeah. Please. I think there's also a new thought process in the Gulf countries that, um, there is an opportunity now for Pakistan to stabilize in some sense. Yes, the fiascos happened over a period of time. Last 15 years have seen the worst of uh, Gulf-Pakistan relations um, heightened by the Yemen episode. But I think uh, Pakistan realized uh, that it had taken a beating with that decision uh, to some extent. And, yeah. and so it quickly uh, went into damage-saving uh, exercise. Um, by sending uh, Rahil Sharif, who was a former uh, army chief, as the chief of the Saudi led Right uh, as he coalition. retired. Right, immediately after he retired. And that came within a few months, I think, uh, less than a year after not uh, you know, agreeing to send troops to Yemen. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that pacified uh, the yeah. Saudis a bit. Uh, thereafter, sure. I think uh, roughly about 3,000 troops were sent to- A brigade, to, yeah. Uh, yes, a yes. brigade was sent to, uh, uh, to Saudi Arabia, yeah. not to play a role in Yemen, yeah. but to somehow be part of the Saudi-led coalition against ISIS, right. against Daesh. So that, right. I think those things help patch things up a fair bit. And then there, was a, a reconnection immediately after Imran Khan took over because mm -hmm. for a long time there were no uh, political visits from Pakistan to the Gulf for at least the last two, three years because of the differences within the uh, you know, government and the army uh, in Pakistan. But I think soon after uh, Imran Khan took over, there, there is a sense of uh, belief in the Gulf countries that now uh, the military and the political establishment see eye to eye. Perhaps this is an opportunity for us to help stabilize Pakistan. Uh, Imran Khan doesn't belong to the same kind of political establishment as the past. Uh, he's a new leader. He's come with a new vision. So if there is a time, just like uh, you know, UAE helped uh, you know, the West and the other countries recognize Mohammed bin Salman, perhaps here is an opportunity that uh, Saudi Arabia is trying to promote uh, Imran Khan and Pakistan, among the other Gulf countries, especially the UAE, to recognize the opportunity available in Pakistan mm -hmm. and go about um, doing business with it a lot better. Yeah. So I think uh, that that's an important uh, factor in the whole scheme of things. Very good. Uh, Kamran, you want to? Yeah, I also yeah. want to point out that both Saudi Arabia and UAE are heavily involved in the domestic political disputes of Pakistan. Yeah. So uh, uh, the People's Party leadership. Uh, the, the family of uh, former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto yep. and her husband, they have 
residents in UAE. Right. And they, they frequently go back and forth. Um, uh, the Prince Mukran, who was once uh, intelligence chief and mm-hmm. crown prince, yep. he, along with Saad al-Hariri, came mm-hmm. to Pakistan to mediate between the Musharraf government and Nawaz Sharif. Right. Nawaz Sharif was exiled where? To Saudi Arabia. Exactly. So th- there is a, a heavy GCC mm-hmm. input into the domestic political uh, situation in Pakistan, especially the civil-military relationship. I also want to point out that from a Pakistani point of view, uh, 20% or so of all Pakistani Muslims are Shia. Mm-hmm. That is also a reason why the Pakistanis did not want to get so they did not see Yemen as Yemen. Right. They saw Yemen as a theater of Iran versus Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. To get into that is already you know and already there is massive sectarian violence in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. So there is that backlash that prevented. Sure. It was very unique in that the Sharif government, along with the military establishment that otherwise don't get along, mm. agreed both on agreed that, yeah. on that we're right. not going to get involved right, in Yemen. Right, right. No, that's, that's a really good point. And, and there are, of course, um, Gulf Arab analogs that Kuwait uh, would never want to get involved in a sectarian fight whatsoever. And uh, they've been very careful not to do that. So um, I think we have time for one more quick question, and that'll be for you. Okay, let tell you what. Let's take two, and we'll answer them quickly. But let's begin well, with uh, you. Yes, I'm, uh, <coughs> the population, in, uh, uh, the Indian and Pakistani population in the Gulf is immense and vastly larger than most of the local populations. So it seems to me that the GCC country must be worried that if there is a big problem between India and Pakistan, that it could uh, translate into major upheavals in their own country. Right. And even in Saudi Arabia, it's not the majority there, but uh, you have three million Indians and perhaps two million uh, Pakistanis, and that, that's a big number. <laughs> so. so uh, this is actually a very big topic, so I'd rather see how far we can get in the time we have uh, on that. And if we do have time left over, then then I'll come to you. But let me see first how we do with this uh, question. I ask it. If we can get to it, we will. Well, very kind. Yeah, I'm Kathleen you. Mystery, and I have a small advisory firm. Yeah. And I disclose right now I spend ha- half my time in Hyderabad and okay. h- India. Down, right. Yeah. And then half here. Okay. Um, question is on p- private sector development. Okay. Now, we've got the big boys playing. Yeah. But what happens about SMEs for women entrepreneurs in the okay. future, and the men too? Right. And do you see an increase in the startups huh. from India to GC and in reverse? Uh, what methods do you think the imp- entrepreneurs can use to be more successful? And what about training and mentorship? And how do you address the issue of risk taking okay. in the minds Good. of the, um, and of course the banking? Right. Because sometimes we're not allowed to have a checking accounts in the Gulf. Right. Okay. This is a great question. Uh, so, and and they actually are quite complementary, uh, because they both deal with the expat uh, communities, and and I think they can be answered in a in a complementary way. So, if um, any or all of you want to take uh, a very short time to talk about the political and economic uh, uh, situation uh, facing uh, you know, these communities and, and the uh, implications of that, that'd be great. Uh, do you want to begin, Afshin? Sure, yeah. sure. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start on, on the and second question. Yeah, on that. Try, to, try to do about um, two minutes sure. each, something like that, because we're it. running out of time. Okay. Uh, you know, on, on this, certainly on the technology startups, um, you know, I, I, Dubai is certainly become the place you go yep. if you are um, if you want to scale your technology startup you might start it in Amman or you might start it in in Cairo but if you want to scale particularly among the Arab technology entrepreneurs you go to Dubai um, you know and we've seen that we've seen that uh, happen with souk.com for example which was sold to Amazon for about 700 million dollars or so Amazing. yeah yeah we've seen it happen with with you know and, and we're seeing a lot more uh, companies um, that, that are moving to Dubai to scale because it's the place you know, where you can actually, um, there, there's at least the most developed ecosystem of angel investors and, and venture capital. It's just, you know, everybody wants to be the next Silicon Valley, but, you know, it, it's Silicon Valley took so many years to, to create, and it had such a unique, you know, secret sauce that, that they're, they're very far from that, but that's the place you go. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you also find that's interesting is South Asian entrepreneurs 
are finding their way to Dubai as well. Um, uh, now, um, it's 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 but that's if they're doing you know a project you know uh, beyond their own home country, right? Because you know if you if you're doing a project, you know if you're doing a technology startup, certainly you want to be in India where there's 1.2 billion people, or you want to be in Pakistan where there's 200 million people. You don't necessarily want to be in Dubai, but you'll probably have a second office. Uh, in Dubai. One of the uh, Dubai-based uh, ride-sharing uh, companies, Kareem, which is a very large ride-sharing company, one of their most uh, profitable centers is in Pakistan. Uh, Kareem goes head-to-head -head with, you know, uh, Uber in Pakistan and is doing very well for itself. So, so SMEs have always had a problem uh, in terms of getting credit from banks. Banks love giving money to the larger, you know, companies, and 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 there's all sorts of initiatives in the Gulf to try to get SMEs more funding, um, but but it, you know to varying degrees of success. The one good news piece of good news in the UAE is they finally came up with a bankruptcy law, where where if you if your company went bankrupt, you're not going to go to jail anymore, mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, and that's that's big news because if you're yeah. if you're an entrepreneur, right. you know, there's a chance that you're going to go bankrupt, right? right? right. Uh, and and well, the fact it's very uh, it, it disincentivizes. Risk absolutely, yeah, absolutely, that way. yeah, yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, if you can address maybe a little bit more Jean Fasso's, uh, you know, angle, that would be great. Sure. Unless, unless you want to talk about banking, yeah, um, and I SMEs, think, uh, which is fun. We, we said the Gulf countries can't be mediators in the conflict, but in a sense, they've already been mediators because they've allowed these two uh, populations, I mean, citizens of two countries, to live in peace to a large extent. I think right. uh, they, they have, uh, you know, laid point. out the rules very clearly that there's absolutely nothing that these communities can, you know... Uh, Import. Yeah, yes. just, just go about uh, in terms of crossing the line, trying to take their uh, rivalry at the borders uh, into these Gulf countries in any uh, sense. Yeah. I think they've done a terrific job in ensuring that tempers are calmed mm. among the populations. Like the and it's a huge population, right? I mean, you have uh, 8 uh, million Indians and roughly about 4 million Pakistanis. So it could just uh, spiral into a major uh, chaotic kind of situation in any of the GCC countries. And I think they have done a terrific job in trying to keep that and it is in their interest so in a, in a sense I think I agree with uh, uh, with what Kamran said uh, mm. in terms of they being able to do something their aspiration so it's not just about their economic interests it's not about seeing a peaceful uh, South Asia but also ensuring that there is calm within their own countries at the end of the day because if there were to be problems there not only will there be chaos within but there's also the trouble of uh, a lot of exodus from you know uh, Pakistan Pakistan, especially from mm -hmm. the border areas into you will have more immigrants coming in, right. which is something that they won't be interested in at this point in but time. It's a really great point, though. Thank, no, but, uh, you yeah. haven't, uh, no yeah. it's just that I think uh, SMEs would continue to be important in the future uh, yeah. simply because I think the Gulf countries are moving into a situation where they cannot guarantee jobs for all their That's citizens exactly in the right. years ahead. So Residence, they're already they're beginning to say that in the future lies in you trying to right. find employment. Don't take us right. for granted. You are not going to get government jobs in the future. Right. If you want to do something, why don't you pick up uh, you know, jobs on your own and start something? And I think India has enough expertise in terms of uh, offering advice on how to develop the SME sector because right. India is now heavily into SMEs. And I think that applies not only to citizens but to re long-term residents Absolutely. as well. So it's, yeah. Um, so, Kamran, uh, your quick, final thoughts? Two and, quick uh, points. Number one, up. to your point, I think, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it, and this is a subject that has not been researched. I have been looking at it for the past couple of years because I had the opportunity to go to Pakistan and spend an entire week with the startup culture. Uh, young people from non-elite backgrounds uh, are really in, in, uh, into this startup culture. Incubators are popping up everywhere, both uh, supported by the federal and the provincial government. Maybe the Gulf countries will take note of that and, and, and sort of, so that's, a, that's a, another subject that needs a lot of time to discuss. Mm. Uh, to your point, sir, uh, I think that we underestimate the power of Bollywood. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. No, and it's, it's a good point. It's yeah. Because if I have not seen any evidence of India-Pakistani expat communities clashing with each other yeah. anywhere, yeah. 
even at the height of tension. So yes, there's sort of like, you know, it, it, there's that debate going on, yeah. but I don't see any and clashes. Even at cricket matches. Even during cricket matches. Yeah, it doesn't, it happen. doesn't happen. We yeah. don't we don't see yeah. those footballers going crazy over each other. No. Uh, we don't see those riots breaking out. It's no. because there is one of the things that could help India Pakistan is this people to people mm. and this entertainment industry. Yeah. Until very recently, a very large number of Pakistanis were going to India to uh, act in their movies. Right. And pa- Indians were coming to the soap opera industry mm. of Pakistan mm. to do it. And, and, and yeah. And so I think that that has, and that uh, trickles down to the expat communities mm. where if you go to concerts and if you go to, you know, these road shows by movie stars, you'll see a very large Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi contingent there. Yeah. So it's the, the Mehu Don answer. That's great. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming to this really important uh, conversation. I think it's been great. It's just the tip of the iceberg. And I think we've, we've uh, touched on a lot of uh, important aspects of this. We will revisit this, um, you know, again and again here because the uh, this uh, GCC South Asia relationship is centrally important to both uh, countries and both regions and, of course, also uh, to the United States, which has important ties to both of them. So uh, please join us again next time at AGSIW and thank you very much. And thanks also for those online who tuned in and thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.